And, and who is our guest? Let me Sorry? Get, let me, and, and her name is, I'll give you a little drum roll. <laughs> Miss Zoe Keating, are you there? Ah, it worked. Yeah. How are you, Miss Keating? I'm very good. Nice to be here. Thank you for having me. Nice. To, I'm, I'm stoked that you could be a part of it here. Uh, we had a chance to talk briefly last night, and then I came and did some homework on you this morning, Zoe, and I'll just say I'm mucho impressed. Uh, I don't know what I had in my mind, but for you folks that don't know uh, about Zoe, you're a cellist. I presume yep. you were classically trained? Yes, since I was eight. Since you were eight, did your did your parents make you do it, or did you want to do oh, it? Oh no, it was totally self directed. I think a teacher asked me because I'm very tall, so you know it's a tall person's instrument. <laughs> Is that? I, I saw that on one of your clips this morning. Can I ask how tall are you? Uh, just five eleven. Oh, okay, all right. So uh, I tower over you by a half an inch. Uh, <laughs> you know what? I interesting enough, I've always been involved on the rock side of things, as we talked about last night, and and haven't had a whole lot of um, experience in, in 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 the classical music zone. What you're doing? Would you call that classical music or some kind of iteration of that? Um, I think classical folks might be a little upset if I called it classical. I'm playing a cello, but I'm playing it in, I'm playing it amplified. Um, I'm playing my own music. So it's kind of like neoclassical, classical crossover. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't I don't really feel like I fit in classical. I feel, I like playing in rock clubs because that's yeah. where my listeners are. Uh, and, and so when you're in the States touring, do you have an agent? Yeah, yeah, I work with uh, Skyline Music. Um, and they book me in the States. They're awesome. Yep. Okay, so that's more of a traditional, you agent talks to the promoters and, and puts you in. Yep. Are, are they typically talking to rock promoters or more what we would call mainstream promoters or are they kind of niche promoters in, in, in your space? Um, I kind of do a mixture. Like Skyline luckily does both arts bookings, like arts venues, and they do clubs. Um, so, you know, I'll play in a jazz club or I'll play in an old school theater. Um, I prefer to do multiple small shows than big shows because I like to connect with my audience. So I'm always looking for unusual venues and it's kind of an issue for me that I feel like there's not the right venue in the States. And sometimes I'm better off renting my own place just yeah. because it's got a better vibe. Yeah, it's interesting to hear you even say that because again, as we were going to talk about with Rich, there was this been this traditional side of the of the the concert business, which has been very tried and true for a long time. But so many artists today are taking things in their own hands and concocting really clever events and, and so forth. And 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 good to see you're doing that. Let me ask you this. Touring in America, I think, in general, is a bit easier. Uh, it, you know, it, to get around their cities, there's not you don't have to worry about changing borders and currencies and all that stuff. Touring in Europe is a different matter. Have you toured in Europe previously? I have. Um, I, I've been lucky enough to go as like an opening act and an accompanist of other artists who could bring me on the bus with them and take care of the logistics. So um, that was my debut to Europe, and I, recently I've been trying to do it on my own. I, I tend to go over when somebody invites me and they pay for me and my family to come, and then I'll book a tour from there. So Awesome, awesome. Yeah. And uh, okay, do we have any questions here real quick before I, I want to ask you how this whole thing worked from your perspective? I think uh, Cody's got a question for Brooke or for Zoe. Yeah, we, uh, Ryan Hagen asked a fantastic question. He says, if Detour reaches its goals, what venues are they partnering with to make these shows happen? And what percentage of the raised money is going to the club to make that happen? Do you want to take that one, Brooke? Yeah, sure. Um, well, we work, we work very closely with promoter partners that we have in London and and um, like I said right now Detour is in London but it will be opening up to the rest of the UK in the next month or two and then beyond that later in the year um, so we still work very closely with all of the artist team members agent and manager and or the artists themselves in Zoe's case um, and then we work very closely with the promoters to actually execute on the show because they still play such an important part on you know, making the night very special and making sure it's a good experience for the artist and um, the, for the fan. So the, the fee structure for a Detour show is actually very similar to, um, to a normal show. The idea is to kind of streamline the process and take out some of the inefficiencies, um, which hopefully leads to artists playing bigger shows um, because they know their demand or playing new shows in cities that they have not been able to get to previously. So in that way, we're kind of trying to generate new income for the artist and, um, and make them more money that way. 
I'll say this for as a, as a former promoter and still you know intimately involved in the live business. You know, promoters by by their nature, I think, are risk takers, um, and that goes without saying. But they're also risk mitigators. And one of the things that's tough that you kind of alluded to, uh, Zoe, is that when you're talking about an artist with with, uh, with an undetermined, you know drawing capacity that represents a lot of risk for a promoter because not only do you have to pay the artist you got to pay the security rent the venue and all of that stuff um, and that makes it tough so this is a great way to to make a get a show done but also to show other promoters that there's something going on Zoe do me a favor if you would and talk about your own experience like I said so often you get these Great mm -hmm. ideas on paper, they don't pan out. You know, you are an example of somebody doing it, and I think for all of the folks out here that are watching, that are trying to figure this business out, uh, I love it when we can have artists that are speaking to other artists rather than a grizzly old manager. So tell your story <laughs> about how you use Detour to get a great gig in London. Well, I, I was already invited to Europe to play a concert in Italy, um, and they were paying for my expenses to get to Europe. And while it, since I was there, I wanted to do another concert in Europe. And generally what I would do in the past is I would try to, you know, choose some cities and contact some venues, you know, send out emails and hope that they reply. Um, and I've recently been doing s analytics on my fan base to try to figure out where they are. And since I'm so internet based, they're all over the world. But I had a sense, you know, that some major cities in Europe, I have, I have fans. Um, and I reached out to Brooke saying that, hey, I'm in Europe. What about doing something, you know, are you working with artists like me yet? Can we do something? And so, so she uh, suggested London, I think, because um, they were there and there was some evidence that I might have some, some fans there. So I wrote to my audience, you know, through my blog and my email list and said, hey, I really want to play a concert for you. Let's try an experiment. Let's you say you would go <laughs> and we'll see if I can get a show. And um, we launched, I think we managed to get enough people to sign up within a few days, like... Rick could say, I think it was like three or four days. Um, and within three or four days, we had enough people that she could go to a promoter and say, hey, I've got this artist, and that's how it happened. Okay. So it was great, because now I know this show is sold out. Um, you know, it's it's great to know that people want you to be there. There's always that worry when you're an artist, like, is anybody going to come to the show? <laughs> <laughs> so it's nice to sort that out. I have that same feeling every time we start this webcast, <clears throat> Zoe, you know? And I think if I had any guts, I'd be a performer. I can just sit in here and make believe people are watching, you know? Um, hey, let me ask you this, you know, when, you know, Brooke or, or uh, Zoe, when people are making these pledges, are they saying, I'll pay 30 bucks or 40 bucks? Is there a uniform price or is it kind of they pay whatever they feel comfortable with? Well, um, when, when fans think... log in, they make a wish list of bands, and they can actually say the maximum price that they would pay for a ticket. So when we announce the show and actually put it on sale, we do set a ticket price, but by the time that happens, we have, we have a lot more data about what fans would, would pay for the show um, and you know how many people will come, depending on what we set the ticket price at. So it's really interesting, because for Zoe, her fans are so passionately involved in her music career and, and love her so much that her average ticket price was actually way higher than we expected it to be and way higher than it was for a normal artist. So it's it's really interesting how you can start to use data to um, make intelligent decisions about, about the show. Well, not, not to get into great details here, so what kind of ticket price are you getting on a show like that? This is the manager of me now going, okay, now let's just talk shop here, Zoe. Uh, I think well, we ended up selling at 15. I can't remember though. I'd have to check that. I'll bet you Zoe remembers. <laughs> I think we started at 15. And I, I, I feel strongly that even though I'm a classically trained musician, often classical music is too expensive for a lot of my audience. And so I really like to keep ticket prices as low as possible. So uh, 15 and a half sounded like a good ticket price to me, something that would be, you know, not too expensive. And so. I, I just, I think it's great stuff. And I think, you know, you, you mentioned <clears throat> last night when we were talking, you played one small gig at a tiny little cafe last time. And how big, how many people are you paying in front of this time? Uh, it was 100 last time. I, I don't, Brooke knows the capacity of this venue is. It's uh, 300, 300, and there's 11 tickets left. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I tell you what, I think from a manager's perspective, that's great progress. If, you know, that's the way we built Incubus. It was 100 people, then it was 200 people, then it was a 500-seater, and then it just kept moving up. Uh, the guys we talked to last night, the Imagine Dragons, same deal. They started, built, 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 and now they've got a live crew. I think Cody, speaking of Cody, he's got a question for uh, you guys over there. 
Yeah, I do. We have a member, Echo Eyes Touring, and they're actually going to be in London in August and July. And they were wondering if there was any way that they could get in touch with you to learn a bit more while they're out there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you can drop us an email at um, just support at songkick.com and um, we'll, we'll chat to you about it for sure. It's really easy. I mean, since, since Detour London went out of private beta and went public, we've actually just seen a lot of artists just kind of logging in, finding their, you know, artist page and, and actually just posting about it and starting to gather pledges really organically. So it's really exciting to kind of see the possibilities of, of artists being able to do that. Excellent. Zoe, I got another couple questions for you, if I could. Actually, this is where I'm going to do some shameless promoting for my new friend, Miss Keating here, who has a three-year-old son, I heard this morning in the background. Yep. Yep. <laughs> All right, so help mom out here. You've actually put out a couple of records. How many records have you sold on your own, independently, no big record company? 60,000. 60,000. Nice. Okay. I got to tell you, I know what it takes to sell 60,000 records, even with the army that used to be called Major Label. That's no small feat there. Um, that's got to be pretty gratifying to be able to do that as an independent artist. Yeah, I, I never expected it, and I never take it for granted. So, <laughs> Okay, now where can they actually get your album? Tell us what the name of I think you said you had two. What are the names yeah. of them, and how can they find them? Um, sometimes I think the easiest way is if you type Zoe Cello into Google. <laughs> but uh, you can buy them on iTunes or on my website, Amazon. And it's uh, my name's Zoe Keating. Um, and, uh, yeah, just Zoe Keating Cello. All right, great. And if, and if you folks are watching, go down and scroll down on our event page. You'll, you'll see some information. Also, can we show our featured video page? If you go on our website and click on the video tab up on our featured videos, there's a great piece about Zoe Keating Avant Cellus from Intel Visual Life. They did a great job on that, by the way, Zoe. Yeah. Yeah, they came over and they took over the house for a day. It was fun. <laughs> oh, God. You know what? I've had done some work with the, the Intel guys over the years. So they must have had 20 guys come over, I bet, right? Yep. <laughs> 20 very smart IQ geeks running around your house. It's good stuff. By the way, not to offend anybody at Intel. Love you all. All right. Well, I want to thank both of you guys for being on the show today. Uh, Zoe, I really enjoyed listening to your stuff today. I, I think I had something else in my mind. And when I got there, I thought, wow, this is... Much oh, different. You. And uh, it's for all you folks that want to feel a little dangerous with uh, classical music, let Zoe be your guide. Oh, yeah. Brooke, always a pleasure talking to you, and thanks for keeping me up to speed on uh, what's going on at Songkick. And I'll be over in London sometime later this year, and hopefully we'll get a chance to, to meet again. Yeah, of course, anytime. All right, thanks a lot, folks. Excellent. Thank you. Bye. That was uh, amazing. You know, I, I love doing this.